Hello all, and welcome back to The Distracted Gardener. I am Charlie, and I hope wherever and whatever you're listening, you are well. I'm going to take the liberty to just dive into our main topic, which is starting seeds and plans for the 2024 garden. I have been talking about and leading up to this for however many weeks it's been now and I'm super thrilled, super excited and also a little bit anxious <laughs> now that I've actually gotten some seeds into pots. The last week was the most exciting for me since the end of last season. We've been having unseasonably warm weather interspersed with bone chilling days the last week or so. Yesterday was like eight degrees but the two days before that were like 20 degrees and 19 degrees that's in celsius and today was like 14 tomorrow's gonna be 19 and the day after that's gonna be 20 and then like after that we're gonna have a full week of days that are less than 10 degrees so it's really sort of strange for this part of february and while i'm terrified about what that means in the long term i did decide to take advantage of 19 degrees celsius 66 degree fahrenheit weather in february to get some important prep work done and actually get some seeds started. Let's start out with the work we've done outside in the garden. I mentioned before that one of the biggest mistakes I made last year was not doing any soil maintenance. And in my heart of hearts, I really want to be keeping a no to low till sort of garden, but I don't think it's such a reasonable thing to aim for when you're gardening in planters. The soil gets worn out because of rain and because it's basically container is effectively an open system so uh you know minerals and stuff get stripped out of it a lot faster than they would in sort of an in-ground sort of garden it also gets super compacted really quickly and it gets too full of wayward roots like i said i really like to not have to touch it much at all except for when i'm putting plants in and out of it and adding compost every now and then but since i've only started using compost within the last six months i don't have any sort of soil structure built up so i think at least for now, I need to keep putting keep putting some work into into it by actually resetting the soil. I'm not really done with the process yet, but I cleaned up a quarter or so of the soil in the veranda garden and about a third of what needed to be done at the school garden. In doing so, I noticed just how badly compacted the soil in most of the planters was. Like I, when I dumped it out onto a onto a sheet, it was like, you know, normally I suppose that the soil's in good shape, probably like when you dump it out, it'll sort of, it should have like kind of a crumble to it, right? But most of it just sort of stayed in shape until I sort of put my hands into it. The good thing is like the refreshing process was really simple. I emptied the planters out onto a tarp, as I said, I removed any overly large root fragments. And then I added in some perlite and some compost from the LFC compost system I've been using since last fall. This is something I talked about a bit over on the blog on naturalfakui.com, so if you're interested in that, please please check it out. So from the planters that I knew previously housed heavy feeders, things like sunflowers, um, for example, also got a hit of organic fertilizer powder or, or gravel or whatever you call that consistency of dried fertilizer. Uh, in doing so, I forgot how much work this sort of maintenance can be. I was I was really knackered after dealing with the stuff on the veranda, but it was on a Sunday, so I had time to like chill out and recover for the day. And I'm off on Mondays too, so that was cool. Uh, the school garden, though, I did it on a Tuesday morning, which is my first week of class, uh, my first day of classes in the week, and I was so toast <laughs> by the time the night came around. It's sort of a necessary evil, though. And I'm sure it'll pay dividends, but I can't say I'm really looking forward to doing the rest of the planners tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and the day after that. I have the suspicion that the more I build up the organic matter in the soil, though, through adding compost twice a year and leaving in most of the root matter from previous plantings, I'll be able to increase soil quality and eventually eliminate the need to do resets like this almost, entire, almost entirely. But I imagine it's going to be kind of a a lengthy process of at least a couple of months, not a couple of months, excuse me, at least at least a full year, a full season, right, to really see any change, but probably it'll take longer than that, I suspect. The next thing I got to do was planting potatoes. As recommended by my friend and listener Julian, I need to work more on higher production in the garden so I can be more self-reliant, and what better way to do that when with, excuse me, what better way to do that than with potatoes? 
also with Yakon, uh, a gift from said Julian. Uh, it's my first year doing potatoes in the veranda garden. I felt my wife's grandfather with them on his plot for a few years now, so I kind of understand the process of of how to plant them, how to heal them up, and all that kind of stuff. But doing it myself, I discovered how many different ideas people have about when and how to plant them out, which I didn't really expect at all. So asking my wife's grandfather, who for the sake of brevity, because it's sort of a pain to say my wife's grandfather every time I mention this person, because I'm sure he'll come up a bit, I'll henceforth refer to him as Ji Chang. But yeah, asking him his response is, this now is the only time to plant them. If you wait until the beginning of March, it's going to be too late. And then when I asked other people, uh, friends of friends, other other gardeners that I know in the area, they warned that it's too early as a frost will beat the hell out of the greens when they eventually sprout. I've decided to take Jichan's approach, but I am readying hoods to put over the containers in the event a frost is set to come after they sprout. I think it'll be a while before they sprout yet, so I'm hoping that I can sort of thread the needle uh, between when they'll sprout and get leaves and when the last frost will be. I'm a little bit worried because our last average frost date is April 6th, I guess. But I have to imagine, and I'm hope. well, it's weird to say that I'm hoping for it, but I have to imagine that with the way things have been, with the weather recently and how mild it's been, I imagine the last frost is going to be quite a bit sooner this year. So I might be able to get away with it without putting on those hoods that I talked about getting ready. Uh, so far, the things I've enjoyed the most in the start of the new season have been seed sowing and plan making. Uh, there isn't too much to say about seed starting, as I doubt my process is dissimilar from any of yours, but I will say that I am using a heat map for the first time this year for the tomatoes and peppers, of which there are going to be just a ton, I think. I'm also being sure to use vermiculite in all of the pots uh, of plants that take a particularly long time to sprout for the sake of avoiding fungal issues. That's something I had a little bit of trouble with last year was um, I had started the tomatoes and peppers and things like that without using a heat mat. And so it just took such a long time to get a lot of the stuff started. Not so much with the tomatoes, but especially with the peppers. And so what ended up happening is that because I was having to add water so regularly, it, you know, it, it kept a, it kept a, a good environment for fungal growth for a longer period of time until those plants sprouted. And so eventually, even when they did sprout, um, they had, you know, what do they call it? Damping off and those kinds of problems. So by putting vermiculite on top of it, I can hopefully avoid the issue. And I use that in my second season to great success. And, uh, as, as I've talked about, like last, last season was sort of my dark year, my dark ages, uh, where I just didn't do all of what I should have been doing. So hopefully by, by doing, by adding the vermiculite on top of the on top of the soil of the of the seed pots that will make uh, a difference. As for what I sowed, I guess let's just break it down into different different categories here. First, of course, our peppers. Peppers are always my my babies. As for varieties, we've got colorful bell peppers, which is, I'm sure there's gotta be a little bit more creative of a name, but that's literally what they're called in Japanese, is maybe, I think they're called like colorful paprika in Japanese. Hawks claw chilies, which is sort of the classic Japanese red chili, uh, jalapenos and Carolina reapers. I know that I said I would forgo the reapers this year, but I would like just one year of a good crop of them for the sake of saying I did so. I have to admit that I'm not entirely certain of where that crop is going to go. Uh, I, I imagine I will string them up on thread and dry them and use them super, super sparingly as a, as a spicing agent, <laughs> as a spicing agent, as a spice in cooking but yeah i mean who knows maybe maybe i'll get addicted to that spice which which happens to be the case completely uh tangent here but there is a there's an instant noodle type of instant noodle here sold by a company called payang that's uh it's like max like it's called like ogre level or like demon level spice or something like that and i think it has carolina reaper in the sauce and is so incredibly hot and it's one of those things that it's not I don't even think it's delicious to eat it. Like the taste is, it's not delicious. It's just super, super hot. But even that I've got sort of a, sort of an addiction to. So I find myself wanting to eat it like once every couple of months, I get the urge. And I wonder if the same thing won't happen with actual Carolina Reapers, but we'll be careful, I suppose, because like, it's crazy. It's crazy. Again, it's a little bit of a tangent, but sometimes you read stories of people who are like, I'm just going to go ahead and eat like a whole Carolina Reaper 
and then their brain swells and then and then they have to have a hole drilled into their skull to relieve the pressure from the brain swelling caused by the Carolina Reaper. Um, anyway, this got kind of dark. But anyway, we'll see what happens. Anyhow, I just I just kind of want to have a successful year with them at least once, and then we'll move on from there, I, I hope, I imagine, anyway. Uh, next are, of course, tomatoes. Uh, I sort of took last year off from tomatoes, mostly. But this year we have round red cherry tomatoes, which are a what do they call that cote what do they call cote it's not a i can't even remember that word this is strange this is strange for me I'm trying to remember the word for for what do you call it it's not open pollinated but anyway uh round red cherry tomatoes are a non uh, f1 and f1 what is it I know what I'm trying to say, but anyway, round red cherry tomatoes, uh, indigo brads, atomic grape cherry tomatoes, which I grew a couple years ago and I really loved, and indigo brads, black beauty for the slicer tomato that I'm going to grow this year. I I know that a lot of people don't really like black varieties of tomatoes, but they have like a certain like tang to them, maybe because of the of the of the bluing pigment of the bluing agent, right? That is the same. It's the same chemical compound that's found in like blueberries and stuff like that that gives it a very unique sort of um, tanginess, I think, and sort of uh, savoriness to the tomato that I really, really love. So I enjoyed growing them, uh, but that was in the year that the intervention happened. So they are sort of tainted a little bit, but I'm going to sort of see if taking my foot off the gas just a little bit won't help me enjoy them again. As for leafy greens, this is one of the bigger categories, I guess. Uh, there's dinosaur kale, red Russian kale, curly kale, chicory aka radicchio, mizuna, and sunny leaf lettuce. I'm going to be starting another wave of these probably next week for the sake of succession growing. Also, I sowed kohlrabi as a test. I'm, I'm trying to see if I can get away with starting kohlrabi now and getting a crop of it before it gets too hot, um, which I guess kohlrabi doesn't quite count as a green because you eat like the engorged stem, but um, it's close enough, so I'm going to put it here. As for herbs, I haven't done too much with herbs yet. I've got parsley and cilantro. Pretty soon I'm going to be starting some mint, I imagine, although I don't know. I imagine it's going to start exploding soon from, from last year, so I don't know if I necessarily need it. But then other things like dill, of course, I'm going to wait until it's a little bit farther along in the season to until I worry about that. As for flowers, we have a lot of different types of flowers, which I'm pumped about. We have nemophila, alyssum, chamomile, globe amaranth, marigold, and violas. Again, this too will be something that's expanded upon as we move more into little bit warmer days. There is one that I absolutely fell in love with, but I'm forgetting the name of. It's native to California. It's not Nepenthes, right? That is a pitcher plant. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'll talk about it, I suppose, when I when I when I actually sow it. I also sowed some beets as I'm determined to make this the year of the successful beet harvest. As I talked about before, I'm I'm really looking forward to using homegrown beets in pickled eggs and things like that, but we'll see how it goes. I definitely reduce the number of seeds that I put in each pot as as we now know that they are compound seeds and you don't really need to plant too many to get a lot of them. This is the first wave of seeds. Soon enough I'll be starting some cucumelon indoors which I'm really excited to try um, and then I'll actually do peas and radishes and other hardier stuff directly outside probably not pretty soon. Pretty soon I'm not sure exactly how soon but soon enough. Now, I mentioned that I have plans for how I want to reshape things this year. This applies to both the veranda and school gardens. As for the veranda, the biggest shift is towards high productivity over variety. Last year, I didn't bother too much with tomatoes, for example, and that meant a drastic reduction in output. With a number of varieties, I'm hoping not to need anything but self-grown tomatoes. Uh, I can get away with making sauce with the slicers that I that I'm that I'm talking about growing the the black beauties and of course cherry tomatoes and stuff like that are fine for salads and other uses. Likewise with the yakon and potato, I'll be feeling a need for more calorically dense crops. If I can stay on top of succession planting for leafy stuff too, I think I'd be able to constantly have salads from just outside my window. And hopefully the work that I put and will continue to put into rejuvenating the soils will allow me to hit these these goals of just getting as much as I can out of each each planter and out of each plant. Uh, as I said before, I'm hoping to be at least, you know, I'd really love to be at least 75% self-grown self, 
self-sustaining during during at least the at least the summer months. I think for me, the single most exciting change this year will be the addition of water features. I'm I'm hoping to do one each in in the on the veranda garden and then in the school garden. I picked up a solar water pump and a holist planter that's used usually for like uh, what are they called killifish, uh, medaka in Japanese. And just using those two things, I could really greatly improve the garden ambience via sound, right? Like how comforting is that sound of just trickling water, you know? So I think, I think that'll do a lot for me as a person existing in that garden. But of course, as I've talked about so many times, I want to do more than just that. Uh, I'm going to plant it out with Eusterellus yet the uh, Mizatora no, which is a native species of aquatic plant that is apparently threatened in the wild. I'm hoping to take part in the effort to rebuild wild populations, but I'll talk more about that at a different time. But Mizutora no is actually an herb in the mint family, and it gets these beautiful like lilac-like flowers uh, atop these 30 centimeter or so stalks. I was going to say sticks, but stalks that native species of butterfly apparently love. And hopefully this will mean I'll be providing... I'll be baby. Hopefully this mean, will mean I'm be providing... Food for pollinators, beautifying the space, and increasing garden harvest in one move. Uh, tomorrow, something I'm looking forward to is I'm going to go hunting for driftwood and rocks along the coast to put into the water feature and sort of builds. Well, I'll, I'll put pictures of it up on the blog once once it's uh, once it's ready to go. But I'm going to be using a company. Uh, excuse me. I'm also going to be using a cutting from from uh, the pothos in my in my gar- in my garden. Excuse me. In my office over to my left here as like a viney final bit of color that will grow around the driftwood. I'm going to secure it to the driftwood probably using maybe like a a zip tie until until you know the roots kind of dig in. And apparently pothos is, is really good for excuse me, apparently pothos is really good at actually cleaning water. It doesn't I guess it can't exist as a true completely aquatic plant so you shouldn't put the whole thing in the water. But if you, again, if you attach it to a piece of driftwood, for example, and you let the roots drift down into the water, it will clean the water nicely. And so you should have a kind of a very nice self-sustained system there. And it should also look pretty good, which is which is going to be a big selling point, both for me and, and of course, for, for my wife, who's, who's a little bit more concerned about the appearance of it than I am, I think. But uh, I've known how important it is to provide water in your spaces for wildlife for a long time. I think I've talked about it a couple times here or on Twitter or on, on the homepage or wherever it was. But the most I've been able to muster until now was some rocks and a dish with some water, like one of those plates that you put underneath a, underneath a, a container to catch the excess water, you know? And I mean, I really hope this helps a number of things, um, all the things that I mentioned uh, in particular. The last thing, well, the last big thing, I suppose, that's set in stone at the moment is the addition of figs. And when I moved in with my wife's family after getting married, as you often do in Japan, I didn't really like figs beyond the classic fig newton. Uh, I think probably because those cookies were the only exposure I ever had to figs. I remember when we would take road trips as a kid, it was always, you know, that was always on the menu where those square, dry, delicious, bendable cookies. Um, my mother-in-law loves dried figs, though, and Fukui has a pretty strong fig farming community, which is really cool. So I've slowly but surely come to love them myself. What I don't like is the price tag, and I also don't like not knowing how the fruit are grown. Uh, for example, what sort of inputs they're being fed. So I'm going to be getting a new fig tree to put in the school garden. And, of course, I don't expect, you know, for example, I'll probably be putting it out, well, probably in April, I suppose, once once uh, I know that there's no chance of, of frosting over, but... Uh, even that, of course, doesn't mean you know I'm gonna I'm gonna put it out in April and then have have figs this year. Probably you know they say what like figs are three to five years until you get like edible fruit off them. Uh, supposedly, if you put them into planters and you give them a good environment while they're in the planter, they'll it'll sort of hasten the process. And sometimes you can get edible fruit in the first year or the second year. And you know I'm hoping that's the case, but I'm you know there's really only one way to find that out. And and if it doesn't happen, then I'm. Pr- you know, I'm prepared to wait that amount of time if it's necessary. But yeah, those are sort of the big things that I have going on. You know, we've got we've got our we've got our soil prep continuing. We've got seeds planted. We've got the water feature, which will probably be done and put out uh, 
by by Tuesday or Wednesday of next week because the the plant we're putting in it is a perennial plant that can be um, survives fine in cold weather. So yeah, those are all the things that I'm sort of pumped about, you know, and those figs. I'm gonna get those figs, you know, eventually at least. And I think that's where we'll leave it for this week. But I want to turn it over to you all and ask if you started your new season prep yet. And also, what are your views on when to do your spring planting of potatoes? Since everybody has a different view, I'd love to hear yours. Get at me with your answers on Spotify, as there is apparently a place where you can answer a question I've set up, so I'll try to do that. But you can also get at me on Instagram, Twitter, and threads at Natural Fukui. Oh, or, there was a strange pause, over on naturalfukui.com. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll find yourself back here again next week when we'll be talking about a recent study by the University of Michigan called Comparing the Carbon Footprints of Urban and Conventional Agriculture.